So yes, I said I'm very happy to be um, kicking off this session with uh, with uh, my uh, fellow Tree Radner Earth Sangha co-founder Shanti Garber. Now Shanti Garber and I go back quite a long way, although we've never we haven't been close in that time that we first met nearly thirty years ago when we were both well, before I was even a Mitra actually when Shanti Garber was living in the men's community in Essen. So what's he been doing since then? Well. He is fairly clearly a Buddhist activist and mediator and lover of life. And I love that bit. Yeah. So he's the author of The Burning House, which is what this session is all about. So which is a Buddhist response to the climate and ecological emergency, which has recently been released by Windhorse Publications. So bringing together Dharma and practical activism. And he's a member of the Tree Wagner International Council, as well as being a regional order convener, a member of the Restorative Coordinating Group, a nonviolent communication trainer and partner to Gazina, which doesn't leave him a lot of free time by the sound of it. And he and Gazina live in Bristol in the UK. So without further ado, I will hand over to Shanti Gaba. Oh, sorry, before that, I should probably make some housekeeping points. So um, you're all familiar with this, but I would just reiterate the usual. So please um, remain muted. And um, all of the, the uh, chat communications will be directed to me, but it might be good just to sort of hold off on the chat until the content has been delivered and then we can all focus fully on, on what we're doing. So just a couple of points to bear in mind. Okay, Shanti Garba, over to you. Thank you very much, Akasha Raja. Um, yeah, I'm very, very pleased to uh, be introduced by you and uh, to keep our connection, uh, our warm connection alive. So I'd like to start with a story from the book. So stories frame this book and uh, particularly um, stories from 2019 and uh, getting involved with Extinction Rebellion and uh, doing non-violence in de-escalation. So I'd like to read you a story from chapter 10. So it was October, 2019, and the rebellion outside the home office in London. Some of you may even have been there. Uh, or close to, close by. The police had just come round telling each person that a section 14 order had been put on the road. This meant that they could arrest anyone who stayed in the road without further warning. Someone handed me the mic and I said to the crowd, I was going to offer a session on nonviolence and de-escalation, but, but now that doesn't seem like such a good idea to take people away from the road. The guy looking after the mic whispered, good call and I saw nods from a few seasoned campaigners. So instead I said, I'd like to offer a kind of regeneration thing. If you want to get comfortable to sit for about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll lead through a guided meditation. So people shifted to, to some hay bales or to my left in front of me and more people joined the group and sat down. And if you'd like to kind of get comfortable to sit for a few minutes, <coughs> you can join us or we can join the people sitting outside the Home Office in October 2019 in the So I started like this. I don't know about you, but I noticed quite a bit of tension in my stomach and solar plexus. So let's start with the body. When you're ready, bring your attention to your skin and then inside your skin getting an overall sense of your body. And allow your attention to trickle down your torso, all the way down to your legs, to your feet and your toes. Picking up sensations in your toes, being furthest away from headquarters. Soles of the feet, heels and ankles, calves, knees, sitting bones, allowing the earth to take your weight. Pelvis, lower back, upper back, spreading into the shoulder blades, and down the arms to the elbows, forearms and hands, and fingers and thumbs. Sensing the life in your hands, warm or cool, tingly or numb. Allowing the muscles at the back of the neck 
to relax and lengthen. Scalp, ears, forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, jaw, throat, and chest with heart and lungs. If it helps, following your breathing for eight to 10 breaths. Now sensing what you're feeling, checking in around the heart. And when you're ready, getting in touch with your intentions for being here, for sitting in this road today outside the home office. Perhaps to do some healing. Perhaps to help create the kind of world you want to live in. The kind of world that you'd like to pass on to your children and grandchildren. Inviting any figures of support or inspiration to support us today. connecting to our ancestors. I felt welcome tears behind my eyelids. Connecting to the people who would be here if they could, to those who support us to be here, to other species, to future generations. Inviting them all to be present here with us in this road today. Asking for their support, and blessing. I chant it. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be happy and well. Others joined in and we chanted together for a while then came, came to silence. When you're ready in your own time, open your eyes and look around, taking in the other people who are here. I pause. I'd like to hear from two or three people. What, what comes up for you? What's in your heart? I handed the mic to a woman, woman in her thirties and she said, I feel much more peaceful and centered than when I arrived this morning. And at the same time, I feel sad. I asked, what's the sadness about? She said, I'm just sad about the planet we're leaving for our children. I said, a note of grief. I wonder who else feels this grief about the planet that we're handing on. Nearly everyone's hand went up. I said, it's worth giving this grief some space some care, space for mourning. It will give us some weight and some solidity as we go through the day. I paused. I guess that's it for me, I said. People applauded. I got up from the ground, wondering about saying my name, but it didn't seem needed. So I walked away feeling quite vulnerable, quite wobbly and quite vulnerable, and at the same time, deeply fulfilled. It was as if I, I dropped a depth charge into my psyche. Writing this now, I can still feel the tearfulness and vulnerability. So, these were some of, this was one of the experiences that led me to uh, 
really wanting to write something um, a broader, to a broader audience, Buddhists especially, but not just Buddhists, about a Buddhist response to the climate and ecological emergency. It's easy to shy away from this issue uh, that's kind of staring us in the face. Overwhelm and fear and even grief are common responses. So how can we, as Buddhists, use our practice to stay engaged and to make a difference? So that's really, those are really the questions I'm asking in this, in this book and exploring in this book. And I tried to do that by telling my story uh, and looking, looking at my experience, trying to understand my experience, working with my own experience of overwhelm and grief and gratitude and anger and uh, overwhelm and everything in between, just kind of resistance and denial. And collectively, looking at looking at uh, the, the the our collective um, the impact of our collective actions and what we can do collectively to address this issue. And and looking at the the Buddhist tradition, uh, the Dharma, what support can that offer us in this uh, in, in this time of, of history? So sometimes on these book launches, I, I say, well, is it an emergency? I mean, I, I use the phrase, I use the term climate and ecological emergency. Uh, and I'm willing to say why. However, my sense is in this, uh, in this group, it's not really necessary for me to go into why. I mean, I, my, my guess is that pe people are here because they're pretty clear uh, uh, about, the, about the science and, and, uh, and so on, that it is an emergency. Um, on geological timescales, it's unquestionably an, an emergency. Compared to similar changes in the past, things are changing in the geological equivalent of, an, of, of a twinkling of the eye. In our fossil fueled growth spurt, we've taken billions of tons of carbon that's been, in the, been buried in the ground for millions of years and added it to the, the regular carbon cycle. For me, this makes it clear that no one gets to sit this one out. We're not just gonna be able to close our eyes and wait for it to blow over. I don't think that's gonna happen, uh, however long we meditate for. It's going, we're gonna be uh, experiencing the consequences of our collective actions uh, for years, decades, quite probably generations. So, Clearly, there's a spiritual aspect to this crisis. I mean, I talk about a Buddhist response to the climate and ecological emergency. From a Dharmic perspective, it could be seen as a crisis of empathy, a crisis of imagination. Well, I would say that because my first book was on empathy. So I would, you know, I do look at things in terms of empathy, in terms of uh, that our imaginative capacity to, to, you know, to, to, to identify with the experience of other people, to imagine the experience of other people. In terms of, in, in, in the climate and ecological uh, emergency, uh, empathy is really our ethical imagination. It's our ability, it's, a, it's an essential aspect of our, of, of our um, uh, capacity to act ethically, because unless we can imagine the impact of our actions on others, we're unlikely to be able to decide skillfully what is going to contribute, what is going to support uh, and alleviate suffering. And I say it's a crisis of empathy, because unless we also engage with the, a corresponding shift in consciousness, trying to change the institutions and the social practices in the outer world is unlikely to, uh, unlikely to last, unlikely to stick, unless we're, there's also a corresponding change in consciousness. So how, how can we face this emergency, take responsibility and act proportionately, or find our role within this, uh, within this kind of emergency? What would a Buddhist response to the climate and ecological emergency look like? What would it sound like? What would even what would it feel like for each one of us? 
and collectively. So as I mentioned last night in a uh, conversation with Devon, in 2019, Greta Thunberg famous, famously told the world's leaders, I want you to act as if the house was on fire. And that was my cue. I thought, now I know how to write this book because that, 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 that the, um, Greta's uh, um, encouragement to the world leaders takes me right back to the parable of the burning house from the White Lotus Sutra, uh, which I studied in, had some wonderful time studying in the uh, Mitra study series, uh, the Tree Ratna Mitra study series. So in the parable, the burning house that is, is um, on fire with the flames of greed, hatred and delusion. And guess what? The climate and ecological emergency, well, the house is also on fire with the flames of greed, hatred and delusion, or at least ignorance. Now we can claim that we didn't know what was going on, that doesn't, all, that, that doesn't mean we won't experience the consequences of our actions collectively. Uh, we, are, we're going to, we, we will be doing that. We are doing that. We will be doing that. So how do we get people out of a burning house when they don't even know that the house is on fire? This is, this is a, a kind of a, a way of thinking creatively about this issue. Uh, so in the, in the parable, the father is trying to get his children out of the burning house. And there are many, many children. And he, the first, his first go at trying to get them out is to say, the house is on fire. Get out of the house immediately. And they take no notice at all of that. Does that sound familiar? So uh, he's completely at a loss. He can see the house is burning down, but the children are taking absolutely no notice of him. They're just carrying on playing with their toys. And you can imagine what our equivalent toys are. The kind of toys that are keeping us in the burning house, keeping us business as usual. You know, we don't need to look far, friends, relatives, even, you know, even devices of different kinds. You know, we're all involved in those games. We're all, we're all playing those games. However, the father, um, has a moment of inspiration, a moment, a sudden, a flash of inspiration. And he realizes he knows what kind of toys his children like. So he, he says, hey, kids, there are some wonderful toys outside, just outside the house, even, even more wonderful than any toys you've got hold of at the moment, uh, better even than the, than the toys on TV. OK, and you can play with them until bedtime. So. When he says that, the children just rush out of the house as fast as they can. Uh, they fight each other to get out of the house. So, he, so the father has a moment of inspiration. He, he presents a vision of what life could be like outside of the house, which is enough to get them out of the house. Then we can talk. Once we're out of the house, then we can talk about, you know, what happens next, but it's just enough to get them out of the house. So I wonder what would be our equivalent? What would be our, our equivalent cry of inspiration in the, in, in the climate and ecological emergency? What could be our equivalent? We need a compelling vision of the Dharma for these times. A compelling vision, which is enough to catch people's attention and also to uh, enough so that actually they're interested in getting out of the house to safety. So I'll just let, I'll just pause for a moment and um, maybe just, yeah, maybe just take a minute to reflect on, on that question. What's, what could be your or our equivalent cry of inspiration? And then I'll ask for some responses in the chat, just sort of brief responses, please, rather than essays, just maybe a couple of sentences.
So what have we got? What, what would you like to write in the chat? If you have access to the chat, what would be, where would you look for your cry of inspiration? What would be the first words? You haven't got many words, bear in mind, because they're playing vigorously with their toys. Okay. Oh, Tracy says, well-being, joy, contentment. Okay, so the message of, yeah, of, of well-being, yeah, which we do try to communicate through the Buddhist centers. Sense of well-being, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? More spare time, connection to others. Oh, that's an interesting one. Connection to others, yeah. Do you know, in lockdown, there was this study on a small area of, of Wales that found that, um, that their quality of life went up during lockdown. Did anybody read that? The quality of life went up. And the reason was that they were thrown back on each other, back on community, and the sense of local community. And actually, their, their quality of life went up because of that, because of that sense of community, that sense of sangha what we would call sangha, yeah? And they're supporting each other, mutual support, mutual care, mutual responsibility. Yeah. Happier, more fulfilling lives, says Andy. Yeah, so, in, yeah, more generally speaking, yeah, potentially more fulfilling. So we need to present a, a, a different way that is less costly and more fun. More fun. It's got to be fun as well, or at least very fulfilling. Otherwise, they're not going to leave the toys they've got. We're not going to leave the toys that we've already got. You know, there's some very compelling toys out there, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you know. Rachel says freedom. Uh, Kasha Raja says appreciation of individuals rather than consumers. Yeah, it's very easy to kind of settle into that kind of consumer mentality uh, on all sorts of levels of like, you know, you pay the price and then you receive the goods in return or the services. Or it's very, very easy to settle into that kind of mentality on all sorts of levels, including when it comes to, you know, the spiritual life or the Dharma life. Yeah. And while I was writing the book as a, as a as a, as a kind of note on that, I, re I really came up against my own sense of helplessness and powerlessness in relation to the climate and ecological emergency. And I started questioning that and kind of challenging that. And, and I came, I came to, to think that um, that sense of powerlessness and helplessness is at least to some extent a, a social construct. It's, it's, it's part of our consumer society that we just sit back and consume. As long as we've got the cash, as long as we've got the resources to pay for those goods and services, we can just sit back and consume and all our needs will get met that way. And um, at the same time, it also induces a sense of kind of powerlessness. Even, uh, even watching the telly uh, or YouTube or whatever, it's, it has that same kind of consumer kind of built-in sense of kind of, I don't know, yeah, a kind of powerlessness, a kind of helplessness, that there's somebody else that's producing all this stuff and we're just absorbing it and receiving it. So maybe that's not, doesn't ring true for you, but that, that's what came up for me while I was writing this book. And, and I came to think, well, actually, I do have some power here. I have, I, and, and I have some power, and I tried to, you know, want, wanted to write a book, and I wanted to encourage us collectively to challenge that sense of powerlessness and helplessness, and also to bear in mind that we're much stronger collectively than we are individually. However strong we are individually, collectively we have a much stronger voice. And when we come back to the puja at 7 p.m. this evening, the uh, puja based on Akapa's uh, Shambhala Warrior Mind Training verses, that is one of the themes in that puja about letting go of the idea that we have to do this alone and really moving into the sense of 
collect a collective sense of uh, addressing this. And this could lead, as Joy says, to less anxiety or more of a sense, more peace of mind which is another way that we could talk about uh, a cry of inspiration. Okay. Another avenue that we could explore for this cry of inspiration could be from the, in relation to the Buddhist tradition, could be interconnectedness. And I said something about this last night, so I won't say so much this morning, but uh, just uh, reminding us of the beauty and intricacy and intimacy of our connections with with all phenomena and all beings. And that in itself could be enough to, 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 to just bring about an awareness of, oh yeah, well, we're connected with all beings. So also in a way we have, we're, we're responsible for our actions and our actions have an impact on all beings as well. Yeah. And I, last night I invited people to to just visualize Indra's net or my version of Indra, an updated version of Indra's net, which is just to imagine the night sky in a sky free of light pollution and the clouds have parted. And we're looking at the whole panoply of stars, almost an infinite number of, of stars. And each star is a, a point of light and is reflected in all the other stars. So that the process of reflection between those stars is in itself infinite. So this is an ecological understanding of the Buddha's teaching on Pratichat Samapada or dependent origination. And it's ecological because nature and all phenomena are seen as relational. They're dependent on multiple conditions, just like us. And intention is also part of this net. Human intentions are also part of this net, this, is this net of Indra's, Indra's jewels. In fact, they're crucial, they're absolutely crucial because we have impacted this net of, well, in the case of you know, our biosphere, we've impacted that through our intentions, through our choices. And we also have uh, choices to undo that or restore those, those uh, uh, you know, where, um, not, where there's been a loss of hab habitat or species. Unfortunately, some things we're not able to undo. However, there are many things that we can address. Life on Earth is dependent on the health of the biosphere. And I looked this up a few days ago. The biosphere is the, the region within which life is able to operate, is, a, is able to survive. It's about 20 kilometers thick but, uh, from the deepest ocean to the highest point where life can survive in the, in the air, in the atmosphere. It's about 20 meters thick. And that thin ribbon of life, the biosphere, is wrapped around the Earth. And that's what we survive on. That's what we're dependent on. What we put up into the atmosphere in Bristol or uh, Shrewsbury pretty soon finds its way around to Moscow, Beijing, Atlanta, Auckland, and so on. So if one jewel becomes cloudy, then they reflect the other jewels in this net less, less well, less clearly. So if any uh, ecological niche in our environment becomes toxic or polluted, it affects the other niches. So this is a way that we can explore Indra's net. And uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I really enjoy this image because it's just very much, I just feel a kind of existential relaxation when I talk about this image, that, that, that I'm part of, of an amazingly intricate and, and intimate set of relationships. I am related. I am, re I am in relation to uh, all beings and all phenomena. And there's something kind of very satisfying in my, in my belly, something relaxes about that. 
in, in relation to that. So there's a kind of gut sense of uh, belonging, a gut sense of, uh, yeah, just being part of something. Really. Just pausing for a moment, just taking a breath to take that in. And if you have any comments or reflections, you could write them in the chat. So I could go two directions now. One is to talk a bit more about grief, which we started with. And the other one is to talk about hope, but maybe they're connected. So, so who, who else? I mean, I asked that group outside the home office, who, who feels grief in relation to the climate and ecological emergency? Maybe if you could just raise your hand, I can see, I can see uh, one screen. I'll just check the other screen, hold on. Okay, so as most people feel some sense of grief, yeah. So that's, an imp that's important information because grief is a measure of, what, of how we care, of what we care for, even what we love. Yeah, so I really try, when I notice that grief, I really try, rather, rather than pushing it away, I try to give some space to it, some, some acknowledgement to it, some kindly awareness to it. Because it really is a measure of, uh, yeah, as I say, it's a measure of what we, of what we love of our love for the earth. And as Joanna Macy says, if we, if, we, if we don't address the grief, if we don't do something about the grief, if we don't acknowledge the grief, we're not likely to get very far with any kind of activism or, or, or you know, change which addresses the issues, because we really need to get down to that depth of love for the earth and experience that fully. And, show a different way that is less costly and more fun from that sense of love for the earth. Gunopita says, living with love and gratitude does affect others around us. Yeah, living with love and gratitude. So it's not just grief, it's also gratitude as well. If we can hold both of these. Yeah, grief and gratitude. And they, they actually, they don't confound each other, they deepen each other. That's what I've noticed as I've explored this with groups around uh, the country and around the world on Zoom. So gratitude for the earth, gratitude. So what are you grateful for being alive on this earth? Maybe just take a moment to reflect on that. Somebody asked me that question uh, in Trafalgar Square a couple of years ago, and I replied without thinking. I said, uh, I'm grateful for the love of my partner, Kazina, and for the, for the touch of sunshine on my skin, for the feel of sunshine warming my skin. And I still am. I still am grateful for those things and many other things as well, but those are the things that really struck me kind of in a bodily way. Yeah. Again, it's that sense of gratitude, of love for the earth, which is going to, uh, which is going to motivate us. You know, love, compassion is what will motivate us to uh, protect and care for the earth. So I'm coming to a pause and there'll be a chance, I think, for questions in a moment. But I'll just finish off by, by, by asking a question which I ask in the book in the, in the last chapter. Uh, is there hope for us? It's a bit of a humorous question in a way, or at least the way I respond, it, I respond to it is humorous, if you've read that chapter. What I say is, well, if, you treat, if we're treating this as an emergency, then there's hope for us. If we're not treating this as an emergency, there's no hope for us. However, perhaps a bit more 
seriously. Uh, I have confidence and trust that the climate and ecological emergency has the potential to awaken us individually and collectively to enlightenment. I see a kind of pathway, I see a door opening in this emergency, in this, in this crisis, that, that we could go through collectively. We, I think we, you know, it's clear we need to go through that door collectively rather than individually because it's, it's on a, uh, because of the scale of the issues. It's, yeah. and it's very difficult for us individually to get our head around the, the scale of these issues. In an emergency, we can trust in emergence. Emergence is another way of talking about uh, contingency or uh, pratichit samapada, or uh, how things arise in dependence upon conditions. It's quite unexpected. Things arise emergently. They, we don't know what will happen. We don't know what will, uh, what will emerge. And how we respond now is crucial it will provide the template for future responses. That is the importance of our actions right now. It's given me a much keener sense of my own responsibility for my actions, for the, for the consequences of my actions, or the likely consequences of my actions. Acceptance, compassion, cooperation, and empathy will lead to different outcomes than judging, blaming, punishing, and denial. They'll lead to very different worlds. And I'll leave you with a question for now. I'm happy to, happy, happy to uh, read questions in the chat and respond to questions in the chat. I'll leave you with a question that has plagued me since, since uh, I heard it. So what kind of ancestors do we want to be? What kind of ancestors do we want to be? Okay, so we we'll just take a pause for a moment. And while we're doing that, if you have any responses to my question about what kind of ancestors, or if you have any more general questions, or topics from the book, then please uh, write them in the chat. Sorry, Akash Roger, I can, can't see the end of that one. Something about hope? I'm tapping it, I'm typing it now, Shanti Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so Akash Raja is asking, well, he says, you may already have answered this in a way, but what's your response to Anilio's statement that hope isn't a Buddhist emotion because it draws you out of the present and into speculation? Well, I, I tend to agree with that. I tend to agree with, with, with what he said. It's like, well, hope implies its opposite, which is, you know, uh, hopelessness or unhopefulness. And it also, for me, it, it can tie into this sense of kind of, helplessness or powerlessness, you're kind of hoping for something to come along and save us. And clearly in Buddhism, and my personal view is that there is no, uh, you know, there's no being that's going to come along and save us all from this, you know, we created this situation, it's up to us to address it. Um, and yes, I think the hope can be future based, it can be based on imagining uh, uh, some kind of better, better future. Um, so that's why I respond to the question, is there hope for us in, some, in my somewhat flippant way about saying, well, if we're treating it as an emergency, there's hope for us. Because I'm tying it in there with, with uh, action, with, 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 with a, um, a view and an action that, well, yes, it is an urgent situation. We do need to address it. We do need to take, take action to address it. And, and in the Buddhist tradition, there's not really much about hope. In the, particularly in the Pali canon, there's very little about hope in itself. There's a lot about confidence and trust, 
which is you know how we might translate for faith you know there's a lot about confidence and trust um and as i say my confidence and trust is twofold is that uh we can trust in emergence we can trust in unfolding things unfolding and, and the actions have consequences certain kinds of actions have certain kinds of consequences and also, I, I'm confident, as I said, I'm confident that there's a there's an opening here. There's a doorway opening here to a greater sense of collective responsibility and compassion. So that that's where my confidence and, and, and trust comes in. And Dikashi says, I prefer confidence because it implies an acknowledgement of dependent origination. If we act in a certain way, things can change. Yeah, I feel more hope. I feel more hopeful in that direction. <laughs> So there you go. Any other questions or reflections? What kind of ancestors do we want to be? So while you're typing, oh, okay, here comes one from Tracy. Can we align hope for emergence with faith? As for example, faith in potential for enlightenment, or would you see these two things as very distinct from, from, one, of, from, uh, distinct from one another? Can we align hope with faith? As for example, faith in potential enlightenment. Hope. I don't really see, I don't have hope in emergence. I have confidence in emergence. It's a bit different. I don't hope for emergence. I guess I, can, I, guess I kind of have confidence that, that things arise in dependence upon conditions and our actions have, con our actions have consequences. Yeah. Akasha Raja wants to be one of the ancestors who helped turn the tide. Okay, that's the kind of ancestor you would, you'd like to be, okay? And Pearl asks, in practical terms, where to start to overcome lethargy, powerlessness, and helplessness? Well, I think starting with, with self-empathy or self-compassion, really just acknowledging the depth of those feelings, so not pushing them away, but actually uh, welcoming them. So saying, well, all feelings are welcome. And in a bodily way, experiencing those feelings and the heaviness and the dread that comes with those feelings, the sense of the sense of kind of lifelessness that comes with those feelings, acknowledging that, fully, fully experiencing that, and exploring what's behind or underneath that. What, what's the longing? What's the motivation? What are we longing for? What is it that we that is precious to us, that is leading to those things? And I would guess. In my world, looking at it, look, looking inside, I would guess it's to do with uh, a sense of aliveness, a sense of connection with life, a sense of belonging even to life, a sense of vitality, and maybe a sense of care and even protection for the earth. I would guess looking at looking inside myself, I would guess it's the, those kind of things are what, what, what is most precious to us. Maybe even love, maybe love for the earth, love for the beauty and the richness and the creativity of the, of the natural world and a sense of, of belonging, taking, a, uh, taking our place in that, in that beauty and richness. So how does that sound, Pearl? Perhaps you could reply in the chat. <laughs> and Ian and Lilia, hi, hi Ian and Lilia, ask, what did you do in the Great War? <laughs> Sorry, the Great Turning, they ask, Granddad. <laughs> so it's that question, instead of what kind of ancestor do we want to be? What did you do in the Great War, Granddad? What did you do in the Great Turning? And uh, Ian and Lilia's uh, response is, the most I could, the most they could. 
Yeah. And uh, David Loy addressed this. I really liked how he addressed this yesterday in his uh, talk, where he said, um, find your role in this situation. So explore where your heart is drawn to, what you're drawn to, where your heart is speaking to you. You know, we all have different ways of responding. We don't all need to go and sit in the street or stand in the street. Although it does help if there are some people who are holding up stop signs and and uh, create some creative disruption. I think it's also in this context. I think it's skillful. You know, creative disruption of of, of uh, business as usual. At the same time, there are many other ways of addressing many other roles that we can take depending on our particular resources, capacities, and responsibilities. Current responsibilities. Okay, so uh, any more for any more before we close? Gundapeta says, do you think we tend to put a burden on ourselves by seeing grief, helplessness, and the cultivation of confidence as things we need to process by ourselves? Are there collective ways? Well, yes, I really hope there are collective ways of, of addressing these things because it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to think, you know, the world is on our shoulders. I don't know if you've found, you've felt that or you've kind of seen other people who seem to be, uh, who seem to be, have the sense, well, the world is on our shoulders. I hope that we can create collective spaces where we can address these issues and where, where we can, where we can, acknowledge that sense of grief and helplessness uh, and cultivate confidence and trust uh, in, in ourselves and in each other. Uh, yeah. From uh, Shadaba, what sort of legacy I leave behind me is a hopeful, positive question for me. Okay, I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah. What kind of ancestors do we want to be? It's an easy question to ask. It kind of slips in there uh, and it provokes for me a lot of, some really deep reflections about uh, yeah, how I want to how, how I want to impact future generations, you know, my actions. Okay, so maybe uh just show the book. So so for those of you who haven't um, uh, seen the book, I'll just show you the front cover. Okay, so it's uh, from Windhorse Publications, nine pounds ninety nine to you, or equivalent in your local currencies. Uh, you can order it from Windhorse Publications. I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. But there's the there's the front cover, and Windhorse Publications website. I'm totally grateful to Windhorse Publications who who had my back all the way through from initial from from um, from 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 initially when I contacted them and um, Dharma Mega supported me uh, very knowledgeably and wisely and kindly through the writing of this book. So it was actually a very satisfying collaborative experience. Oh, yes. And the book's behind me as well. Yes, I forgot. You can have a seat. Um, that's a kind of pantomime response, isn't it? It's behind you. Okay. And it's available as an ebook for you, for, you, for, for those who don't who read their books uh, on a device nowadays. It's available as, a, as an ebook for $7.99. And what else? Let me just show you this thing. Uh, I'm doing an eight week course. If you want to follow up, I'm doing an eight week course on the Buddhist Center Online starting 16th of October. The Burning House, the Buddhist response to climate and ecological emergency, eight Saturdays from the 16th of October in the evenings, UK time. Um, and there'll be a facilitation track for those of you uh, who are interested in offering this course, a course based on the book. And we'll, the, the, the course is based on the book. I ask you to read uh, a number of chapters each week and then present some activities uh, um, and reflections based on those 
based based on those those chapters. So it's a way of going through the book with a group of people. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat to that. Hold on. And I think we're nearly done. Um, links in the chat. Hold on. So here's here's the link to the book at Windows Publications. No, not that one. Mm -hmm. This one. So here's the link to the book. See, here's the link to the eight week course, which you can make Saturday evenings, UK time. All right, I think we're just about done. So handing back to Akasha Raja. Well, thank you so much, Shanti Garber. I was just reflecting in the last few seconds about what I might say. And one of the things I've noticed, the effect of the cumulative effect of this whole conference has been to put me on a on a quiet but sort of steepish trajectory towards confidence. So I feel as you know, as I don't know, regardless of the seriousness and the gravity of the issues, I mean, I expected to come away from this not feeling oppressed and, and more scared and more alone. I feel the, the, the opposite of all of those things. You know, I too have confidence in emergence and having heard, you know, Shanti Garba as the last of a whole list of, of inspiring speakers, I, I see no reason to change that, that, you know, that going forward that we can make a difference, that we, we, we have every reason to be confident in the workings of positive emotion and positive action in the world. And yes, yeah, so once again, many thanks indeed, Shanti Garba, for this invaluable contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much.